floss tube. My name is Laura and I am the Nerdy Needle. I am really, really excited about all of the followers that I have acquired in the last week or so since I posted my first floss tube video. It's, um, I'm actually blown away um, by all of the kind comments and all of the people who think what I have to say is useful to them and it's worth their time. So thank you. Thank you for all of the kind comments um, all of the questions and just the interest in what I'm showing. It's really motivated me to do more videos, to really think about my own stitching and to pass, pass on what I've learned um, to others, as others have done for me. All of the stitchers who have taught me, I guess now it's my turn. So again, thank you so much. It's, um, I, it's really amazing. So as we're progressing towards me showing you how I do um, the parking method on full coverage pieces with leaving my threads on needles, um, the one step that we still have to do before I can show you that is to talk about how to start and end threads without flipping your work over. So if you have needles with threads on them, you're going to have them nice and stable on the front of your fabric, but if you have to flip your, your project over um, every time to end a thread, those needles are going to start dropping um, out of their position and they're going to start tangling. So um, it's important to know how to start and end threads without flipping your, your project. Um, so that's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how to do the loop method start, which most of you probably know. Um, a pin stitch with a bit of a twist on it that I just learned about a week ago from a fellow stitcher, and then how to do a waist knot. So I'm going to quickly show you how to do that on a piece of um, large count Ida that I bought, and, um, and we'll go from there. So I have a piece of six count Ada fabric uh, that I'm going to use to show you how you can start and end a thread without flipping your frame over. So I've got some embroidery floss, so I just need to pull one strand. So I am going to show you how to do this with uh, two strands of floss. So you just pull one strand of floss. So there's my one strand. And here's a trick that I've learned recently. Um, this was from Jean Farish is a brilliant idea. I have a damp kitchen sponge. This is just a jam jar that's a convenient holder for, or the jam jar lid. Um, it's convenient to hold my damp sponge. So what you do is you just pull your thread through the damp sponge. Makes kind of a neat noise. And what that does is it straightens your thread. So it will reduce the number of slip knots that you get and your stitches will be prettier. The two strands of your stitches will be more likely to lay parallel to each other, which makes for prettier stitches. Um, so the sponge, it's just damp. I wrung it out until there's no more water that comes out. Um, by the time you thread your, your floss um, on your needle, it should be dry. If you're finding that it's still a little damp, then just wring your sponge out a little bit more. So you take your two ends of your thread and you put them together and that's what you're going to thread through your needle. And this is going to get us starting on the loop method. So there's my strand of floss. So again, um, we're starting and ending threads without flipping our a frame over because we don't want to disturb all of those needles that we're going to have parked with threads. So basically you come in from the top where your first leg of your stitch is going to be. For me, that's bottom left to top right. If you go the other way for your first leg, then you would do it that way. Um, you have a loop here. This is why it's called the loop method because of that loop. You put your needle through it and you pull it down to the fabric. And then you take your needle and push it through one of the holes. It doesn't matter which one. And then you just pull on the thread and it'll pop that loop to the back. Now this is really large count fabric. Um, on smaller count fabric, like 18 count, which is what I stitch, um, you'll probably have to give that thread a little bit of a tug and you might even hear that 
loop pop as it goes through to the back of the fabric. But once you have that there, then you can just um, continue stitching from there. So how do you end a thread without flipping your um, frame over? So that's when you do something called a waist knot. So if I wanna end this thread about five to 10 stitches away, I'm gonna come up through the fabric and just put a, put a knot that sits pretty close to my fabric. And then you just snip that off. This thread I'm going to keep on a needle and that's where the Paco needle organizer comes in. So I would just park this, this thread on its needle in whatever symbol that it's um, that it is so that the next time I need it I have it to use. So how do you start a thread when you don't have that loop? Well you basically reverse the waist knot process. So if you don't have a loop to start with you put a knot in the end of your thread and let's say I need to put a, another stitch right there of this color. So again, about five to 10 stitches away, I go down through the fabric, come up where I want that stitch. And I just continue stitching like so. Okay, so what does this look like on the back? So what you have are carried threads on the back and as you're stitching along, as you're heading towards your waist knot, these carried threads are going to get covered up by um, threads so that it, it's going to secure that carried thread. So essentially when you get to, um, when you get to the waist knot, so you'll stitch, 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 stitch. And when you get to where the waist knot is, you just cut this off and that carried thread that's running behind the fabric is going to be secured by, um, by all of those threads. So there's one thing to be careful of with, um, with waist knots. And that is if you have a very dark thread that you're going to carry with a waist knot. So if you have a very dark thread that is going to be traveling underneath a very light color, then you need to be more careful. Um, so basically picture that this is like say black and then all of the stitches in between here are say a pale yellow. Well, what happens is because you have that carried thread on the back, it's right up against the back of the fabric. The pale yellow that I've described would be on top of that carried thread. So there's some chance that you're going to be able to see kind of a dark, like a faint shadow, um, or it might look like the, that, faint ye that pale yellow um, stitching looks maybe a little bit soiled or something. Um, you're, there's a good chance you're going to be able to see a faint line where that dark carried thread is showing through because everything on top of it is a light color. So the solution for that is to do a pin stitch. So the only time I use a pin stitch is if I'm stitching with a very dark color and I have, um, I know that there's going to be light colors that are going to um, go on top of it. And so um, I don't want to carry, I don't want to have that risk of that carried thread becoming visible on the front. So to do a pin stitch coming in from the front, let's say that I want to put a pin stitch basically just secures your thread. Um, so let's say that I want a pin stitch right there. So I come in from the, from a near hole I'll leave a little tail. I don't put a knot on it because this isn't going to stick around for very long. This is a modified pin stitch that I just learned about a week ago and it's brilliant. So I'm coming up in my starting hole. 
I go down in the middle of the block. If you're stitching on even weave, you would just go down uh, over one thread. Come in with your second, um, the second hole of that leg, going down in the same hole, and this is the one time when you actually want to split that thread in the middle. And then you just put your second leg on and the second leg covers up that junction in between those first two legs of that stitch. So that's kind of a modified um, pin stitch. This is not going to go anywhere. This is, this is so incredibly solid. Um, you can cut this tail off now. Um, and this is secured. In fact, if you're doing a pin stitch, um, double check and make sure that that's actually where you want to put your pin stitch because getting them out is a pain in the butt. So try to avoid having to frog a pin stitch if you possibly can. Now something that happens not so much on a very large count fabric like this but on smaller count like my 18 count that I usually stitch, usually you end up with a little bit of the fuzz um, let, that's stuck in that hole I use this tool. This is called a snag nabbit. It's one of my favorite tools, um, stitching tools. All it is is a long needle. It's got a sharp point on it. And instead of an eye, it's got this, you can hear it. It's a rough texture on the back end. And what that does is if you have any kind of bit of fluff that's come up to the front, you just put your needle through and you hear it kind of catch all of the fuzz and it pulls it to the back. Um, it's a fantastic tool. I use it, um, it's one of my, my all time favorite tools and because I'm not flipping my frame over and because I'm using waist knots that will leave kind of fuzzy ends to threads, it's not uncommon for me to accidentally carry some of that fuzz to the front of the fabric with my needle and so I just reach for my snag nabbit to get rid of it. I'll put a link to where you can get one of these. Uh, they're about seven or eight bucks. Um, highly recommend this tool. So we've got our pin stitch. I can show you what a traditional pin stitch looks like. Um, so you can do those from the front also. So a traditional pin stitch, you come down and instead of um, coming in through the hole, you come in either through the bottom or the, the um, kind of look at the, the square of the um, Ada and you want to run your pin stitch parallel if you're doing it kind of the old, the, the classic way. So you come up kind of towards the edge of the block. You go down the middle, come up at the top, towards the top. Same thing as before, you wanna go down through the middle and split that thread. Then you cut your tail off. The other way that you can get rid of um, a thread, you can see that's caught there, is I just scra scratch the back of the fabric with my needle to kind of get it out of there. So you can kind of hear me scratching and that kind of pops that thread away. And then you just do your, um, your stitch. And this thread, this fabric is so large count, it's actually almost harder to hit the holes. Um, you can actually end a thread using a pin stitch. Um, I've seen people do this, this not on full coverage pieces, but say you have a pattern that's got a bunch of stars on it or snow or something. So you have a bunch of individual stitches and you don't wanna carry your thread between those. So you can start with a pin stitch like I showed you. I would probably start with the angled one like that. And then you can, um, you can also end with a pin stitch. On smaller count fabric, this is a little trickier to do, but it is something that I do on occasion. So you come up on the other side, you go down the middle, 
come up on the opposite side. You kind of have to shove those top actual stitches out of the way. And, um, and so now you've got a pin stitch and that should be nice and secure. Come up to the front and you're done. So that's another way of um, starting and ending threads if you just have a single stitch and you don't wanna be carrying any threads. Um, so pin stitches for full coverage pieces, the only time I use them is if it's a very dark color and I know that it's going to be lay that the thread, the color that's going to get layered on top of it, on top of any carried threads is going to be a light color. That's when I use a pin stitch. So we've got the loop method, the pin stitch, and the waist knot. Those are the three ways that you can start and end threads without having to flip your frame over. So we're looking at what happens on a project when you carry a dark thread under um, lighter colors for making a waist knot. So in the bottom corner of my tapestry here, it's gonna it's incredibly faint, and this is under a very very bright light. Um, you can make out a slight shadow right there. You can see it, it comes off to this kind of pinkish white area right here, coming from the point of that green. If you look on the back, this is why. There's the point of the green heading off to that whitish area. So what happened was I needed to end this dark green thread. And so I did a waist knot and I stretched it off to the side, get it out of my way. And then I continued on, but the issue is, is that I'm stitching with a significantly lighter color. It's also one color, so it's a uniform color. And so a combination of all of those, the fact that this is so much darker of a color than this orange, and that this section here happens to be solid one color of that lighter orange, that means that if you look really closely, you can make out a very faint shadow, which is that um, that carried thread on the back of the fabric um, for the waist knot. So there is a solution for this, and this is what I've been talking about. So if I were to do this again, I would I would aim my waist knot to lay under these green threads, or I would end with a pin stitch. Either way, and I completely eliminate this problem.